commentator is Basil Risedale. A sensational disaster unrevealing the war. The British battleship Barham is torpedoed, capsizes. Eight hundred men perish when the magazines explode. Hitler's most terrifying secret weapon, the V-2 rocket, is disclosed. Jet propelled, the V-2 rises faster and faster until a speed of 50 miles a minute is attained. And no defense against it has been discovered. Another V-2 is launched, a weapon that just one year earlier might have changed the entire course of the war. A funeral train rolled slowly past the grief-stricken people of a little town in America. And all over the freedom-loving world, hearts are bowed. All that is mortal of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, four times President of the United States, leaves Washington. Vice President Harry S. Truman takes the oath of office on April 12, 1945, and succeeds to the presidency. At Hyde Park, New York, it is a soldier's funeral, with all honors to the nation's departed commander-in-chief. The last flaming hours for a doomed city. Berlin, once mighty metropolis of a proud nation, now crumbles under the merciless pounding of Russian artillery. The senseless last stand of the Nazis results only in complete devastation. Nazism comes to an ignoble end. General Dwight D. Eisenhower treasures a gift of the pens the Nazis used in surrendering. In Berlin, Eisenhower arrives to attend a momentous meeting which determines the zones of occupation in Germany. General Montgomery signs for Britain. Chukov signs the agreement for the Soviets. General Eisenhower signs for the United States. It is a proud moment for Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of Great Britain, as he reviews the victorious Canadian and British troops in Berlin. President Truman, flying to Germany for an Allied conference, salutes an American division. At Potsdam, the President reviews the Army of Occupation, where once the Kaiser's legions paraded. If we can put this tremendous machine of ours, which has made this victory possible, to work for peace, we can look forward to the greatest age in the history of mankind. That's what we propose to do. The flag that flew over the Capitol at Washington on the day of Pearl Harbor is raised at Potsdam. Victory echoes across a thankful Europe as Parisians turn out in holiday mood and General de Gaulle pays tribute to the undying spirit of liberty. Holland is liberated by Canadian armies amidst wild rejoicing. Not even joy over liberation can shake their determination to mete out swift justice. The Dutch relentlessly round up collaborators and whistlings. In Copenhagen, General Montgomery is wildly cheered. And the Danes' heroic King Christian never surrendered to the Nazis, receives a tremendous ovation. In Oslo, Norway, Crown Prince Olaf joins in the celebration. Rudolf Hess, third-ranking Nazi before his spectacular flight to Britain, is held for trial. Field Marshal Hermann Goering loses his sidearms and all his arrogance when captured by the American army. Field Marshal von Rundstedt, he advocated the elimination of enemy people by starvation. Marshal Henri Pétain of France is tried in Paris as a traitor, and only his advanced age saves him from a firing squad. The hated collaborator Pierre Laval goes on trial, and his arguments fall on deaf ears. Swift 
French justice condemns him to be executed. In Manila, the Jap General Yamashita faces a military court of five American generals. Revolting crimes are charged against him. One of the greatest scenes in American history is filmed on Iwo Jima by a daring cameraman. On the costly battlefields of Okinawa, the final campaign against Japan is fought to a finish. Signal Corps, Marine and Air Force cameramen follow the 10th Army into the Oroku Peninsula in their final mopping up drive that smashes the remnants of once powerful Jap forces. An atomic bomb explodes over Nagasaki, Japan. The Japs were ready to sue for peace when this one bomb wiped the city off the map with reverberations felt politically in every capital of the world. Nagasaki, viewed from the air, is just one tremendous area of ruin. The unconditional surrender of Japan on board the USS Missouri. General MacArthur gives one pen to General Wainwright the other to Britain's General Percival, an historic moment for all the United Nations. The first American occupation troops went to Tokyo, the famed 1st Cavalry Division, Liberators of Manila. The American Embassy, fortunately undamaged amidst the bomb-smashed city, is the headquarters of the Supreme Allied Commander, General Douglas MacArthur. He arrives accompanied by Admiral Halsey, famed commander of the Third Fleet, the same flag that flew over Rome and Berlin is raised over Tokyo. At the Korean naval base, the Japs have their Pearl Harbor. But no sneak attacks smashed these once powerful ships. They were challenged to come out and fight. BJ Day halts the redeployment of thousands of troops from Europe to the South Pacific, and the greatest American army in history begins a slow process of demobilization. Ships laden with veterans who smash the German armies in the West pour into East Coast ports. The Saratoga, veteran of eight major carrier actions, brings South Pacific veterans into San Francisco. Navy men, too, are coming home. And what a thrill! Five million New Yorkers turn out to celebrate Navy Day and cheer President Truman as he passes up Fifth Avenue en route to review the greatest armada of fighting ships ever assembled. Strung out for miles at anchorage in the Hudson River, the fleet thrills vast crowds of spectators thronging Riverside Drive. Here are veterans of historic naval actions, their crews saluting as the president's ship passes. And carrier planes fill the skies overhead. Twenty-one guns from every ship in the fleet is the presidential salute. And there's the great battleship Missouri firing. is the majestic climax to a light victory on the seven seas. Battle veterans of the mighty naval forces are home at last from the Atlantic, the Pacific, and all the far-flung fighting areas of the greatest war in history. <laughs>